The Guardian. The Guardian Books Podcast with Sarah Crown. The Assyrian Library of Asurbanipal had thousands of clay tablets. The celebrated Library of Alexandria in Egypt consisted of almost a million papyrus scrolls. Great modern libraries, like the New York Public Library, contain some 10 million books. I'm not sure that I collect books anymore. Some of the fun went out of it when the internet came along. I now look out for books purely to read. And if I like them enough, I'll keep them. But it's a good book, don't you know? I act the way I act because the good book tells me so. If I want to know how to be good, it's to the good book that I go. Because the good book is a book and it is good and it's a book. If I were to read a book a week for my entire adult lifetime and I lived an ordinary lifetime when I was all done, I would have read maybe a few thousand books, no more. In a shop with books in. 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 That's the bookshop band who've been touring the country this last month to promote independent bookshops and, of course, reading. Beth Porter, Poppy Pitt and Ben Please are based at a bookshop in Bath. And after they played, they told me what got them started. We started in a shop called Mr B's Emporium. And uh, so we're a group of three musicians and they, the proprietor, Nick, asked us to come in and perform some songs at his author event because he wanted to sort of change the way that they did them and start off the evening with some relevant music. Um, he asked us to play covers first, but we were not very good at playing covers, so we thought, <laughs> oh, we'll just write them. And then we walked out of the shop and thought, actually, that's quite a big task. But we really enjoyed it, and so we respond to the author's books who's coming in, play the song at the start of the event, and then it's sort of gone from there, really. Right, so it's a, it is actually a responsive thing then. So you have the text and then you write a song based around it. Is that the idea? Yeah, very much so. So we try and read as much of the book. Quite often we do actually, it depends on how, how soon we get given the book. And how long the book um, is. And how long the book is, <laughs> quite right, yeah. And then respond to a theme in the book or maybe a scene in the book um, or a character that we have something, some sort of, I suppose you always have to have a connection with something in the mm. book so that you, so that the song is in its own right something you feel passionate about as well. And so it's not then a case of kind of getting the book and doing like a sort of pricey <laughs> in verse. <laughs> we have occasionally done something that's like is about the, the full story, isn't it? We did like the Paris wife and that was kind of a, a tale from her point of yeah. view and it kind of went from beginning to end in a very succinct way um but yeah it's normally a response to something in the book i suppose so are there any books in particular that you are sort of desperate to tackle <laughs> we've been given a lot of recommendations since we've been on our tour um which we've just finished most of um we've had a guest book and we've got some recommendations uh, in there but mostly all the books are chosen by mr b's bookshop right so it's not things that we'd normally choose but that's quite good because that you read things that you wouldn't normally pick off the shelf yeah. and actually we've enjoyed all of them so tell us a bit about the tour quickly well we we spent a year writing these songs in mr b's and playing to about 25 people who always come back to the same event the same or same people to the different events and uh, we thought well let's take this out to some other bookshops mm. and play to a few more people and it's it's been absolutely wonderful kind of going to all these every bookshop is completely different and it's quite interesting to set up a band in a space that's not designed for a band but it, it always sounds really nice mm. and very intimate gigs and um, very interactive and so we've been doing that and we're just going to finish off with a um, uh, a sort of a less intimate gig in Bradford Avon and in the Wiltshire Music Centre which is like this big orchestral concert hall so wow. it'll be quite different to what we've done yeah. but um, it's all the songs from that first year um, of writing so we're going to do A Shop With Books In which was a song we wrote for inspired by bookshops There's a lot of songs inspired by books so we thought it's fair enough to write mm -hmm. something inspired by bookshops 
There's a story waiting inside behind the door as it opens wide and I wandering, hoping to find something. They tell the stories we know and those we don't are waiting to be held and taken home. There's a strange man inside who knows what I like. He'll rush with tea to my side and a stack of books piled and if I'm lucky enough, well, there will be lots of stuff that makes me smile inside. In a shop with books in. In a shop with books in. In a shop with books in. In a shop with books in In a shop with books in It kind of sounds like being the poet laureate or something this idea because normally you think when when you think of songwriters um you think of them as you know sort of being inspired to write something by something that's happened but this is much more of a kind of commission basis isn't it does that have any particular problems or or not i think it's been really lovely to do because there's always something in a book to that you feel passionate about so they are quite personal but at the same time you're given the book to do Mm -hmm. you don't really have a choice in the book because that's given to us which is actually really nice because if you had to choose a book I mean there's countless books to choose from and actually one of the things we found within this band context is that having deadlines and having constraints just means that you you know you lose all that procrastination or worrying if second guessing if something's good or not and you just do it and it's it's really liberating and it's actually been the opposite of stressful it's just been a complete pleasure to respond to a challenge basically. So have you ever been given a book where you thought, I just hate this, I can't, I can't possibly write anything about it? <laughs> or is that an unanswerable question? We, we managed to find things from the book <laughs> that, that you could draw, draw from. I actually enjoyed it. It's all personal taste, but um, we still drew things from the book yeah. that we could turn into other, you know, into a song. So yeah. There's about a thousand million songs in every book, so yeah. there's always something that grabs you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, because Mr. Bees is an excellent shop, they always get really nice books anyway. Yeah. So I think we've had a really good selection. Um, like, and not things we'd normally read, but then you, you never know you, you know. you need to go on personal recommendation, someone who knows you mm. and says, well, you might like this. And um, so yeah, I think we've been quite lucky, mm. really. OK, and the songs that you're going to play for us today? Um, and the second song we're going to do is inspired by... Um, a book called Notes from an Exhibition by Patrick Gale, um, who's actually going to join us at that Wiltshire Music Centre Centre um, concert. Um, and it's based on the last scene in the book where um, uh, the, the book is about a, an artist who's sort of coming to the end of her life. She's slightly unhinged but has a very loving family around her and this song is based on when one of her sons is walking back from a party and um, he's thinking about all the different members of his family and what they mean to him. Um, and they're all Quakers in the book, so he holds people up in his mind and showers them in light if he wants to kind of give good thoughts towards them. And so he's going through all the members of his family and holding them up. It's called Petrock and the Lights. My mother keeps my father's heart She's an artist, he's her
workshops, books, reading, but how many authors actually write about reading? Though almost all would say it's an essential part of their writing life, descriptions of the pleasures of this personal, insular act are few and far between. But Siri Hustvet, the novelist and essayist, has included a fascinating piece on reading in her latest collection, Living, Thinking, Looking. Passionate about visual art and a student of psychology and neuroscience, she writes that the way she remembers any novel is as a visual impression. Most people create mental images for textual experience. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned in that essay, in philosophy, less so unless you're reading a particularly visual and narrative philosopher. So that's why sometimes I think philosophy can be difficult to grasp because we're not instantly making pictures. I mention uh, Madame Bovary, how I remember Madame Bovary and the fact that when she's running to the chemist shop and is basically on her way out, uh, poor crazy Emma, I have this very visual image, which includes much that is actually not in the text. I mean, I see her hair blowing. It's very cinematic in my version. It has nothing to do with what Flaubert wrote, except that we know that Emma's running and his description, there's a path, I believe. Mm -hmm. But my visual image is what I retain, not the actual text. Yeah, and what I find interesting um, when I'm reading myself, and you talk about rereading Middlemarch, which yes. is a book that I've reread several times, is that you don't necessarily remember it before you start reading it, but then you find that your images of it, it's like going back into a room and you realise that you've placed everything still in the same position that it was in before, it's, you know, nothing's been moved. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's extraordinary because I think that was my fourth reading of Middlemarch. Before I began my fourth reading, I could have said many things about the book, but I could not have outlined the way the plot develops in any absolute specific mm -hmm. way. But as I was reading, I called it anticipatory memory. So once I started reading, the next section would appear before me because, of course, I had read it several times mm -hmm. before. Visual art is something that you've written about a lot in your career as a writer. What is it about visual art that attracts you as a, as a writer? Because often the two things are difficult to mash together. It's hard to write about the visual. And I think that's almost one of the things that comes out in your essays is the difficulty of that. I, I think I'm, I'm very interested in that. I don't think that text and images are the same. I think they're very different. Um, and looking at a work of art, um, or at least a, a painting, a, a still work of art, the work is there all at once. And that's very different from a movie or uh, a novel, uh, both of which are sequential. Mm -hmm. And I also think uh, visual abilities, human visual abilities, are older and predate both verbal language in, in all its respects and especially written language. Yeah. They're two very different things. And putting an image into words is, is always difficult. But there's something interesting about the challenge. This is called Search for a Definition. Ambiguity, not quite one thing, not quite the other. Ambiguity resists category. It won't fit into the pigeonhole, the neat box, the window frame, the encyclopedia. It is a formless object or a feeling that can't be placed. And there is no diagram for ambiguity, no stable alphabet, no arithmetic. Ambiguity asks, where is the border between this and that? There is comfort in saying the word chair and pointing into the room where the chair sits on the floor. There is comfort in seeing the chair and saying the word chair softly to oneself, as if that were the end of the matter, as if the world and the word have met. Naive realism. In English, I can add a single letter to word and get world. I put a small L between the R and the D and close the chasm between the two, and the game gives me some satisfaction. Ambiguity does not obey logic. The logician says to tolerate contradiction is to be indifferent to truth. Those particular philosophers like playing games of true and false. It is either one thing or the other, never both. But ambiguity is inherently contradictory and insoluble 
a bewildering truth of fogs and mists and the unrecognizable figure or phantom or memory or dream that can't be contained or held in my hands or kept because it is always flying away. And I cannot tell what it is or if it is anything at all. I chase it with words even though it won't be captured and every once in a while I come close to it. That feeling of nearness to the shapeless ghost ambiguity is what I want most, what I want to put inside a book, what I want the reader to sense. And because it is at once a thing and a no thing, the reader will have to find it, not only in what I have written, but also in what I have not written. Siri, thanks so much for reading that to us. Um, oh, you're I thought, very welcome. <laughs> thank you. I thought that that piece was particularly interesting in the context of your collection, Living, Thinking, Looking, because you have gone down the road of, of seeming to close off the idea of ambiguity by, by categorising the, the essays that you've included into these three different sections, and I wondered why you'd done that. Oh, I think it gave some order to the collection. Um, and actually, as I point out in the uh, author's note at the beginning, of course, these sections are, as all categories, by no means absolute. And I, I also say that, of course, no one can do much living, um, you know, no m much thinking or looking if you're not alive. So <laughs> there's, you know, living is essentially the whole category here. Um, but it was um, to some degree arbitrary, but it made sense because the living category uh, has to do with the most personal essays mm -hmm. and thinking um, are some of the more esoteric essays, some of them um, written for specific events such as the the 39th annual Sigmund Freud lecture that I gave in Vienna uh, last year in 2011. And looking uh, are actually really belong together because they're all essays about artists mm -hmm. or what it means to look at art. I think. And memory is a subject that, as you said, you know, they're, they're in separate categories, but they, they do have kind of collective themes and memory is one of the themes that runs through this collection of essays. Why is it so important that we write about memory? Because everyone does it, you know, all great writers, you know, Nabokov, people like that. It's, it seems to be one of the things that we are most obsessed with. Yeah, I, I love that book, Speak Memory, mm. actually. It's uh, one of my favorite books um, about th this issue, about recollecting the past, bringing it back into the present. But um, I think it's because our conscious memories, and that's what we're talking about, we all have a lot of subliminal memories, memories that we might be able to bring to the surface and then others that are, they may be somewhere in there but we'll never get them out. But the, this conscious memory is a creative and imaginative uh, form of being. So that the memories that we have, our conscious memories, are never original. They have shifted and changed over time and without knowing it, we have altered them as time goes on. I find that fascinating. So that recollecting the self in the past and imagining the self in the future appear to be part of the same faculty. They are not different. It's a very destabilizing notion, isn't it? This idea that everything that we remember and everything that we project is completely subjective, actually. And it's, it's, it's um, I think, for many people uh, to discover that we are not carrying around some factual, documentary, remembered self is destabilizing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there can be something liberating about it. And uh, I was just reading a paper the other day by um, a very famous memory researcher named Daniel Schachter um, and another researcher. They wrote a paper together, and they were talking about the fact that memory is unstable, that it shifts, um, it's not reliable. And they said, actually, this may be adaptive uh, in an evolutionary sense, that it might be good for us. Because if we were just carrying around rote memories, uh, we would have less flexibility to anticipate the future. You are a novelist, obviously, as well as an essayist. Which do you find the easier discipline? Which is more satisfying to you? Do you feel that you need to have them both? I need to have them both. I've come to feel that the most difficult 
thing in the world is to write a good novel. For me, writing fiction is a deep experience of mining emotional territory that I'm sometimes frightened of, and that it's always a matter of trying to find the real story. And that often involves going into territory that is risky. This can happen with an essay, too, that you find yourself going in directions that are surprising. What is an essay, do you think? How would you define it? Because it's, it's one of those things, I think I know what it is, and I know one when I see one, but I don't really know. It's a very, well, you know, it comes from the French word essayer, to try. And I find this to be a very liberating idea. What the essay and the novel have in common is that they're both elastic forms. Uh, you can do anything in a, in a personal essay. And I always think of, uh, about an essay as a journey. It's never pre-planned. I don't know where I'm going. I have an idea about something. And then I ask myself multiple questions, or one question produces the next question. And I see what happens. Otherwise, it wouldn't be any fun. So it's not like writing up a research paper, and it's not, for me, like an academic outline where you have everything in place, you're filling in the blanks of information. It's a motion of discovery. And so that's why, then, presumably, so many essays are, are personal in a way that you wouldn't at first necessarily expect, if you were new to the form, that, that the, the author of the essay will often place him or herself within it. Probably the greatest writer of essays was uh, Montaigne. And when you return to Montaigne, you understand how the real essay works. And it's this incredibly flexible form. So we will hear about Montaigne's bowels and his uh, illnesses, his personal suffering, uh, his friendships, his loves. But then he'll move in the next paragraph and start telling us about Plutarch because it is something that is resonating with what he's working on. So I think... Montaigne remains the probably the greatest essayist that, that ever lived and the most flexible. It's really interesting hearing you describe it that way because the description, to me, sounds like the description of the act of remembering. You know, you're thinking about the way in which you're ill and then you, that triggers off an association with a book that you've read and all of that kind of thing. So do you think it is then an act of expressing memory? Listen, if we didn't have conscious memories... We couldn't do much, and you can see this. We can see this in, in neurological patients who have various levels of memory impairment. People who have brain damage to the hippocampus, which is an important part of the brain for conscious memory and navigation, uh, have not only bad memories, but they are unable to imagine detailed scenes. So their imagination as well as their memory is impaired, which again suggests that these are related faculties. And I do think in writing essays, one is using one's imagination as well. And my use of myself in the essays is always as an example. Siri Hustvet's Living, Thinking, Looking is published in the UK by SEPTA. Ben Lerner's first novel has grown directly out of his reading. He spent a year researching literature in Madrid on a Fulbright scholarship, and his novel Leaving the Atocha Station, named for the main railway station in the Spanish capital, grew out of the conjunction of his research and his travel, as he explained to Richard Lee. Writing for me is so much about discovering the content of a book and the act of composition as opposed to kind of having an idea that precedes writing. But I, I think what appealed to me about this poet in Madrid was both that on the one hand, it's a long and historically rich genre, novels about young artists abroad or Americans abroad. And on the other hand, I felt like there wasn't really a book that placed it in a contemporary context. And I was interested in taking some of my ideas about the arts the structure of some of my anxieties about the possibility of authenticity and putting them into a character who's in a foreign language and watching what happened when those ideas kind of ramified into his personality. 
So did you find yourself writing a piece of extended prose, which you weren't sure it was an essay or it might have been a poem? Or you, did you find yourself writing something and gradually you found that it was it turned out it was a novel? Or? Yeah, that's basically how it happened. I mean, I, in fact, I had, I had written a kind of academic essay on the poetry of John Ashbery. And I had written some things that I thought might be prose poems or might be sketches for an essay. But as I wrote, I started to kind of find this voice, find the rhythm of a syntax that I thought kind of captured the rhythm of the thinking of this protagonist. And once that happened, you know, I kind of listened to the language. So, you know, Tolstoy talked about rushing home to see what Vronsky would do next. And I think there's something to that, that you, you, you have to let the plot unfold as, as, as much as you kind of force it to unfold. Which were the touchstones you had? Which were the bits of the canon that you were resting on when you were putting your artist um, abroad, adrift? For the American abroad, the serious example of Hemingway, where instead of just being writers, the people who were like in Spain are also, you know, revolutionaries. They're, they're kind of men's men. I mean, from the sun also rises and are in a different way that for whom the bell tolls. And I, I don't think those books were in any way examples for the writing of this one except as kind of negative examples like I wanted to write a book that kind of measured the distance between that image of the American abroad and the contemporary experience of an American abroad from Henry James on there's this American fascination with the young person artist or not abroad in Europe for James you know it was about this anxiety about American culture measuring up to the treasures of the old world for my protagonist, I think it's quite different. I think it's more like, what is it like to be the representative in a certain sense of American style capitalism or a reorganization of global space where even when you're abroad, you're constantly re-encountering forms of the American, as it were. Yeah, he's, uh, he's very upset about being an American, isn't he? Coming across other Americans abroad. He almost, there's a moment where he reaches rock bottom in Barcelona when he realizes he, he wasn't capable of fetching coffee in this country, let alone That's understanding true. the Civil War. He hadn't seen the Alhambra. He was a real American. Right. But of course, he also talks a lot about how one of the forms of the American is precisely the desire to appear otherwise. And he starts to sense in Spain the presence of all of these other Americans whose greatest skill is fitting in and pretending not to be in any sense a representative of the culture of the United States. Mm, yeah, he's, he's a pretty odd fish, isn't he, Adam? He's, he's an awkward fabulist or some sort of downright liar. He's lying around yeah. uh, doped up on industrial quantities of prescription drugs and hash and so on. What, what, was it a, a, a voice that you found through the language? What, how did you find this guy? Well, I mean, I think to a certain degree, he's like an exaggerated version of a structure of anxiety I have, right? I mean, he's he's kind of an anxiety about what counts as immediate experience, you know, like is 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 his experience um, of his relationships mediated by language in a way that falsifies them by prescription drugs, by other kinds of drugs? Are the arts authentic media or they are just, you know, are they just screens under which we project what we pretend to discover? I mean, Adam is a kind of exaggerated version of someone consumed by those anxieties, but I think those anxieties, you know, are also my own to a certain degree. He's so unreliable that I think he maybe shouldn't always be trusted um, even when, when he's contemptuous of himself. One of the forms of his fallibility is whether or not he's even reporting on his own dishonesty in an honest way. My plan had been to teach myself Spanish by reading masterworks of Spanish literature, and I had fantasized about the nature and effect of the Spanish thus learned, how its archaic flavor and formally heightened rhetoric would collide with the mundanities of daily life, giving the impression less of someone from a foreign country than someone from a foreign time. I imagined using a beautiful and rarefied turn of phrase around the campfire after Jorge had broken out the powerful weed and watching the faces of the others as they realized their failure to understand me was not the issue of my ignorance or accent but their own remove from the zenith of their language. I imagine myself from their perspective once I'd obtained fluency in this elevated idiom, erratic, my example coming to stand for some dormant power within their own language so that henceforth even my silences would seem well wrought, eloquent.
there's a lot of reading going on, including there's a hilarious performance that Adam gives of his poetry. But there's there's not much of it making sense. Somehow, even though he doesn't he doesn't seem able to read anything without actually just focusing on the experience of reading it, somehow you manage to actually grab the reader and tell a story that is about Adam. Well, that's right. But also, I think he's on to something when he talks about being caught up in the sweep or the action or the temporality or the texture of time as it passes in a, in a work of literature and not only being focused on the content or plot. I mean, I think that like when he reads the poetry of John Ashbery, it's not shallowness that makes him feel like the content of the poem kind of dissolves as he reads. It's not a critique of the poem. It's actually kind of celebrating the way certain works of literary art um, allow us to experience the action of a mind, the syntax of thinking, the way that poems can become things to experience and not just descriptions of experience. When you found that you were writing a novel after three collections of poetry, did you feel like, Adam, that you were slightly worried by that? I was surprised to find myself worried about writing a novel, that I was like a, a, a traitor to my genre or something. I didn't know I had that that fear until I was actually writing one. And I think in a certain degree, like the way I was constantly worrying about whether or not I was writing a novel um, or should be writing a novel kind of enters the texture of his anxiety. I mean, there's even a point in which he claims he would never write a novel. But I, I became very interested in the way that the novel could give me a kind of distance from the other modes of writing I was doing, a distance that allowed me to comment on them and think about them. I mean, you know, writing a novel lets you include poems. It allows you to create fictions where you can kind of test out ideas that, you know, might inhabit your criticism. And a first-person novel really lets you get interested in developing a character through capturing the kind of language of his internal ruminations. And that's something I haven't really done before in other modes. So I, I just got very interested in how the way I was writing sentences, you know, even before I knew I was writing a novel, the way I was writing sentences, it eventually became clear to me that I was kind of in the head of a character. And then I wanted to create a fictional world in which he could, you know, move around and get into trouble. And I am very impatient with contemporary novels that make the claim for you know realism or a kind of to, to be like transparent vehicles and what you're supposed to forget your reading and just go to another world that's always seemed to me less interesting than novels that can incorporate into the work the complexity of fiction making and raise questions about why we might be compelled to make a fiction in the first place Ben Lerner talking to Richard Lee Leaving the Atocha Station is published by Grunter. What to look out for in the next few days? Well, in the Guardian Review on Saturday, we have Pankaj Mishra picking over the ruins of the British Empire, Joe Dunthorne reviewing Ned Bowman's book, A Long Listed The Teleportation Accident, and me interviewing the brilliant Tim Parks about his latest novel, The Server. In The Observer on Sunday, we have an interview with Shirley Conran on the 30th anniversary of her original bonkbuster, Lace, and an early heads up for next month when we'll be reporting daily from the Edinburgh International Book Festival. If you haven't already, now is the time to subscribe to our books podcast. That's via iTunes or the podcast page at guardian.co.uk slash books. Thanks to Richard Lee, Ben Lerner, Siri Hustvet, our producer Tim Maybe, and of course the Bookshop Band, with whom I will say goodbye. I'm Sarah Crown. Shall stand high, fills my eyes. I can't describe. Who knows what you'll find? A lovely. To be in company of such purveyors of quality Her knowledge is vast, her hand reaches out And pulls the spine of a beautifully bound Book of delights picked especially for me In a shop with books in In a shop with books in In a shop with books in In a shop with books in
For more great downloads, go to guardian.co.uk forward slash audio.